Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am here today at the Tohus Musit, the Danish Royal Armory uh, Museum, and I am taking a look at a really cool self-loading rifle. Now, as far as I can tell, this is the first self-loading rifle that was actually used in military service. And what's really impressive about that is that development on this began in 1883, which is three years before the invention of smokeless powder. Now, nobody would be able to develop a functional self-loading rifle before the advent of smokeless powder. The problem was the soot and the, the fouling from black powder just made a true semi-automatic rifle impossible. It could be, you could get one to fire for a couple rounds, but that powder fouling would, would fill up the gun fast enough that no one was, it was impossible for anyone to actually make that work. Now, with this rifle, uh, this was developed in 1883, and by 1887 they had a mostly functional version. So they were able to, they got lucky, basically, in that they, by the time they had this, the mechanism worked out, smokeless powder was actually starting to come around and become available. So they were able to use this with smokeless powder. Uh, now, this is, this was adopted, sort of adopted, by the Danish military in 1888 as the Forsus Recul which I've butchered the pronunciation on, but they actually called it the Experimental Recoil Operated Rifle. And uh, it was developed by two guys named Madsen and Rasmussen, or Massen and Rasmussen. Um, Rasmussen was the, the actual fabricator, Massen was the designer, and Massen would go on to form the Danish Recoil Rifle Syndicate, the Massen Company. Uh, and this is basically the very first version of what would become the Madsen Light Machine Gun. So we are going to take a closer look at this in just a moment, and I can show you all the internals, and it's amazing how similar this is in function, uh, in, in principle, to the automatic, the machine guns that would serve through World War I, World War II, and even into the 1990s in some places. So what we have here is a recoil operated firearm. Instead of having a bolt handle on the side, it has a lever, uh, not that different from a lot of the, uh, the lever action rifles that preceded this. Um, and actually we're still quite popular when this was being developed in the 1880s. On the top we have really kind of one of the most, well everything about this thing is interesting, but another interesting feature of it is this, which is the magazine. So instead of having an actual detachable magazine, what this has is a um, kind of like a, a Gatling gun Ackles feed strip sort of thing. This is basically a built-in stripper clip. So up here at the top we have a little detent, and that prevents cartridges from coming back up. What you would do is put cartridges in this, and I, it holds 8 or 10, I don't know the exact number. Uh, it's chambered for 8 by 58 rimmed, which was the Danish standard military cartridge at the time, and that was a black powder cartridge at first. And this acts like a magazine. So the cartridges are going to be fed down this into this thing. Now the way that works is, when the action cycles, you can see I'm pushing, in fact you can, you can see the lever on the shadow back here, um, it is a recoil operated rifle, so when you fire the whole barrel assembly is going to push backwards, and just like a modern Madsen machine gun, or a Madsen machine gun that would come later, uh, these, this uh, pair of spring-loaded feed pieces pushes a cartridge laterally from here into the action where it's going to get pushed in front of what is basically a semi-automatic falling block bolt. We can get a really good feel for how that works because it has a really big hinged door in the side. So this is the unlocked position, and I can just lift this up and we can take a look inside. So this is the bolt, and you can see there are tracks in it that operate things on this side panel. Um, basically these tracks are what force various operations to happen when this center assembly recoils back and then forward. Now the charging handle here is connected to this lever, which is inside this hook. So when I pull this back, it's going to pull the, the whole barrel and bolt assembly forward and back. There's a recoil spring located down here, right inside the, the wrist of the stock. And this is all very similar in concept to how the Madsen light machine guns would work, um, but more refined and simplified. So the feed cycle on this is 
it's unusual, but it's, well, okay, it's actually really complicated too. Let's just get out there and say it. Um, we have a, a position here. This is the, at the top of the bolt, there's a big opening in the side. And this opening is where a cartridge gets pushed from this magazine stack laterally over into the bolt here. Now, there is a little uh, tower, or a little uh, side plate in there. There you go. You can see this little side plate just in front of those springs. That gets pushed down when it's actually feeding. So a cartridge goes into here, then the bolt is going to come all the way down. Cartridge is fed from this tube down into the chamber. There's a rammer that I believe is actually missing a piece in here, so I can't show you that. Um, but the cartridge goes in there. Uh, in the Madsen machine guns, there was a big finger uh, rammer that kind of shoved the cartridge forward like that. Uh, then the cartridge, the, the bolt, is going to come back up to this center position. And in the center position, it's actually locked. It's head spaced properly here to hold the cartridge in the, the right depth in the chamber. And there's a firing pin in the very center of the bolt. We can actually see that firing pin right here when the bolt's all the way up. So that's the actual breech face of the gun. When the gun fires, this whole assembly is going to recoil backwards, like this. And this, the cam that runs in this little track, is going to force the bolt up. Uh, that's going to trip the ejector. The empty case is going to get kicked out of the chamber there. It's going to come back on this curved track that you can just kind of not really see up in the top there. And the, the empty case comes straight down here and out this opening on the back of the gun, or the bottom of the gun. What's really interesting about this as a mechanical system is that it has really a very short receiver for a semi-automatic action, because unlike the vast majority of guns, the bolt's actually not cycling back and forth. It's only cycling up and down. So you only have to have like the length of the cartridge in the receiver length, um, instead of having to provide several, you know, this much more space behind for this to reciprocate. It doesn't reciprocate, it just goes up and down, like so. Um, it's complex, but it's a, actually a functional system. As, in, as we saw in the Madsen light machine gun, this would go on to be a very successful uh, design and system. It's just that in this iteration, it was a little bit too early. So, we'll close that, lock it in position. Um, I should also point out when you're not using this, you can push this lever, this snaps forward and acts as a cover over the whole feed system to keep it clean. And then on this side we have a safety. I'll be honest, I'm not sure which is safe and which is fire. This gun doesn't appear to want to uh, cock all the way, so it, there's something a little bit wrong with this rifle and it's not fully functional, uh, which isn't surprising given that it's like 125 years old. The only marking on it um, is the serial number. It's number 46 up here, and that, that number is on a couple of the internal parts as well. But that's all you've got for markings on it. One other interesting feature of this is they did decide to put a bayonet on it. Um, and it is this integral folding bayonet that snaps out like so. And it's a very low profile bayonet. Um, it's actually slightly dished here to fit under the barrel. It's short. Um, it's honestly probably not all that useful, although it does keep people away from the muzzle end of the rifle. What this resembles very much is the Johnson, uh, the M1941 Johnson rifle bayonet from the US, uh, and for a good reason. Both, of, both that rifle and this one are recoil operated, and so hanging a lot of extra mass on the end of the barrel can cause problems with functioning. The rear sight here is very much an 1880s type of rear sight. Uh, we have notches on the side here, for uh, four, five, six, seven, and eight uh, hundred meters. I think this is the battle site position of probably three. And then you can lift this up to shoot out to 2300, like so. So I suspect when this is in its proper functioning state, uh, all three of these sections will collapse together when the, the system recoils. Um, however, in its current state, it will come back to there and no further. But you can see wear on the, the pieces here indicating that it did at one point cycle all the way back. So that's why I can't demonstrate the safety is because it doesn't fully cock without cycling all the way back.
So this rifle was tested by the Danish military in 1888, and it was found to be, well, it was good enough to go into field trials, and they made 50 of them. But the, the conclusion of the field trials was that this wasn't suitable for the infantry. This was just too complicated of a gun. However, it was probably suitable for, say, coastal defense fortresses, where, you know, there isn't a whole lot of mud, they get stored nicely, they can be taken care of, and they're not in extreme elements. Um, and where the self-loading, the semi-auto firepower was of particular use if you had a, an attacking naval force. So uh, these rifles were actually issued out to the, by the Danish fleet uh, to coastal defense fortresses. And in that way, they were the first self-loading rifle in military service. Now, did these ever actually see combat? Not that I'm aware of. Um, however, that doesn't change the fact that they were there and ready should it have been necessary. Now, this design would be developed further, and in 1896, a much improved version would be tested by the Danish, and they would actually adopt that in substantially more numbers. So I will have a follow-up video on that coming a little later on. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to give a big thanks to the staff of the Tohus Musit uh, for letting me in here to take a look at an amazing early, the earliest self-loading rifle here. If you enjoy seeing this sort of thing on the internet, please do consider checking out my Patreon page. It's uh, support from folks there at a buck a month that makes it possible for me to uh, travel to places like Copenhagen and take a look at rifles like this one. So thank you very much, and definitely check the museum out if you're ever in Denmark.